Well, good morning, Ransom Church. My name is Cody Toops, and I'm the executive pastor here. And I just want to start off this morning by saying I am so proud of you, church. It's been really cool to hear the stories of how people are growing in their Christ likeness. They're growing to look more like Jesus. It's really exciting to hear the stories about how you're helping your neighbors out in this time that's quite honestly not normal and is a little bit weird, if we're honest and stories about the generosity that has been pouring out of this church. And so I just wanna say thank you so much. It is a privilege to be a part of this church. It is a privilege to call this my home church because of you. And we are so thankful for you and we cannot wait until the day where we can meet together again in person. But today we're in week two of a series called Undivided and we're looking at the fact that we're quick to blame anyone and anything around us for the lack of spiritual movement, whether that's social media or it's culture or consumerism. And last week, Pastor Phil talked about what it means and what it looks like to love God with all of our heart. And that if we're going to do that, we must first determine our focus, we must have a funeral, and we must dress for success. And if you missed that message, I would encourage you to go back onto our social media pages and on our website and check that out so that you are caught up. But this week, I get to talk about what does it mean to love God with all of our soul? You see, we're talking about one of the commands, one of those pieces of scripture that we see in the Bible that says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so I have to ask, if we're gonna talk about loving God with all of our soul, how is it different than loving God with my mind, my strength, and my heart. But more importantly, we have to ask the question, what is the soul? What is my soul? What is the soul? And how does the Bible define it? Because you see, when we look at the world around us, the world throws the word soul around all of the time. In fact, we have soul music. We have soul food, which I can only assume is better while listening to soul music. When I was growing up, there was a band called Soul Asylum. And we have a phrase that if the person you're with is absolutely perfect for you and it's like they were hand designed for you, they are your soul mate. We learn about the soul as we watch cartoons. If Donald Duck were blown up with a stick of dynamite, I, I, I'm not crazy in the head, hang with me. If he were blown up with a stick of dynamite, you would see Donald Duck ascending up into the heavens like this transparent image of him floating away with a harp and a halo. Or we also learn about the soul when we read books, listen to music, watch movies, and we, we understand and we see that our soul is at risk. And we have phrases like, the eyes are the window to the soul. Well, no wonder we're confused about what the soul is. So I thought, let's start with Webster's Dictionary. Let's see what they define as the soul, and here's what they say. It's the immaterial essence animating principle or actuating cause of an individual life. Or they say it's the spiritual principle embodied in human beings, all rational and spiritual beings, or the universe. Well, that clears it up, right? <laughs> no, not at all. It's confusing. All we know by the way soul is used in our culture is that it is referring to something that is deeper and more foundational to the person than we know. It's more than their personality, it's more than their style, it's deeper than uh, their preferences. But beyond that, we don't know much as a culture about what to say about the soul. And so I wanna turn to scripture for our help because the Bible speaks about the soul a lot. It tells us that we can fear for our soul, we can lose our soul, we can save our soul. The soul can feel wounded, it can feel in trouble, it can feel contentment one day and torment the next. Obviously, we can love with our soul, but one of the most telling passages about the soul comes in the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, where we read the account of God creating things, and in chapter two, he gets to the creation of the first human named Adam. Let's look at Genesis two, one through seven together. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. And on the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all of his work. And God blessed the, blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all of his work of creation. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth, for the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth. 
and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered the land. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. In verse seven, it says that God grabbed the dust, or in some versions, it says he grabbed the clay and he formed man. But man wasn't alive yet. It took the touch of God to breathe life into his nostrils, it says. And when he did that, the breath of life gave the man a living soul. Now we see the opposite of this as well. Anytime we've attended a funeral where there's an open casket, we've seen uh, someone who's died and we know that when we look at that, there's this emptiness that is there. The body remains, but it seems to be just a shell. The essence of the person is gone because something is left and that something I believe is the soul. You see, the human soul as God's word sees it, it is the very essence of a person. It's your life that is given to you by your creator. Now while your soul has something to do with your body and your mind, your feelings, your will, it also has something beyond all of that, even greater than the sum total of those things. Because your soul in scripture is referred to as your source of life or your vitality. It's the center of who you are and who you were. It's the part of you that's eternal that will spend the rest of eternity with God forever. Now, I know this body right here and its 40-year-old glory looks great and it's amazing and unbelievable, or at least that's what my wife tells me, and it's hard to believe, but one day this will actually perish. I know know it's hard to believe, but it will. But if you remember last week, Pastor Phil said that loving God with all of your heart is loving him with all that you are. I would say loving God with all of your soul is loving God with all you will always be because it's that part of you that's eternal, that will live forever. So that means then that this, uh, my soul is meant to be deeply rooted in a loving relationship with my creator. And my soul then becomes the deepest part of who I am and has to be connected to something. And that something is it has to be connected to God. In essence, then, we are hardwired because of our soul to be in a place that deeply satisfies the soul, and what satisfies it is Jesus Christ. We may try to fill that need with other things, but the soul will never, ever, ever be satisfied without God. Listen to the words of the psalmist here in Psalm 84, verses 1 and 2. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body, and soul, I will shout joyfully for the living God. Has anyone ever fainted? Would you raise your hand right now on whatever device you're watching or wherever you're watching from? Have any of you ever fainted? Throw a hand up in the comments section. I would love to know if you've fainted. Because you see, one of the most embarrassing moments of my life actually came when my second child, Jackson, was being delivered. So Kristen and I are in the delivery room of the hospital and things are going well and everything seems to be looking good. Um, and, And then it happened. I remember Kristen had been in labor for a few minutes and she asked for an epidural. Now, now keep in mind, I have this weird thing, and don't judge, all of you have your own weird things, but I have this weird thing about needles, and there's just something about them, when I see them, I get a little lightheaded, I get a little woozy. Not only that, I had never seen an epidural administered before, and I had no clue what I was about to see. And so Kristen's been in label for a few hours, she asks for that, and the anesthesiologist, he rolls in the cart with all of his supplies, and he begins prepping Kristen's lower back and unwrapping everything, and he gets it all ready to go. And then it, and then it happens. I look up, and he pulls out this five-foot-long needle. It looked like a machete or this sword that he's used in medieval battles, and, and I feel it. I start to get woozy, and I start to get a little lightheaded. Now, from this point on in the story, I can't really tell you what happened, But I have to tell it from Kristen's point of view because she reminds me of it frequently. And so I watch him insert this into her back and I'm gone and I don't remember what happens. And Kristen says that the doctor begins to ask, he says, hey, hey, how are you doing? And Kristen's like, I'm doing great. And he's like, no, not you. He's like, nurses, get on him. And she's like, what? 
And she looks over and there I am, sprawled out on the floor, passed out because of those needles. I am the one who needed the nurses in the delivery room, not my wife giving labor because I couldn't handle the needle. And Kristen, to this day, reminds me of that all of the time. Now, I don't think that's what the psalmist had in mind when he said that he faints with longing. Because you see, fainting is a scary thing and it actually says more about my fears, being fear of needles, than it does about my desire for God. To faint with longing as the psalmist says here, is this idea that I have this felt recognition that I cannot live without God. He is not an extra optional something that I insert into my life or a welcomed enhancement to what I'm already doing. It's an understanding that he is my life. And I am only alive because he has breathed the breath of life into my soul. And so my soul needs this, it knows this. And the reality is, is that my soul's neediness or its desire for God is a good thing because that invites from God his generosity, his grace, his goodness into my life. And my soul will begin to grow in God when I finally acknowledge its neediness for him. Because you see, our soul's problem isn't its neediness, it's our fallenness. As I've said, our soul has been designed to point us to God, but instead we want to point our soul to the things of our own desires, our own gods that we've created. We want to set our minds, our bodies, on our wills on the things of our own personal devotion. Things like sex, money, power, pornography, control. Now you may be sitting there watching today from your living room or on your phone, wherever it is, and you're like, Pastor Cody, that's great, but those things don't control me. And I wanna say, praise God, that's awesome. But let's not forget food, our iPhone, children, spouse, whatever it may be, because you see, if we're more devoted to these things than God, the Bible calls this an idol. Look with me, if you will, in this scripture at Exodus chapter 20, verses one through five. It says, then God gave the people all those instructions, all these instructions, excuse me. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or in the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. You see, the beginning or the first part of the Ten Commandments here has to do with the misplaced direction of our souls, has to do with us not loving God with all of our soul. The reality is is that people are looking for earthly answers to an eternal problem. You see, because God has called us to live in this world with an eternal perspective. So that passage in Exodus, thinking through that, says, no other gods before me. Don't make for yourself an idol of any kind. Do not bow to or worship these idols. Translation, put God first in your soul, in your desires, and in your life. I like how John Ortberg says it. This is what he says in his book, Soul Keeping. He says, the soul cannot give up its idol by sheer willpower. It is like an alcoholic trying to become sober by promising himself that he won't drink anymore. It never works. In many ways, what the Bible calls idolatry, we call addiction. You can be an addict and never touch a drop of alcohol or a gram of cocaine. Nice things like food, shopping, recreation, hobbies, and pleasure can move imperceptibly from casual enjoyment to addiction. I know men who buy expensive boats and feel compelled to be on the water every weekend, not because of their enjoyment of serial boating, but because if you're spending this much on something, you better enjoy it. Have you been there? Maybe you're there right now. Can you relate to that? Listen, you need to hear me about idols. Idols turn us away from our freedom in Christ, but the way of Jesus sets us free from the bondage created by idols. And this is where grace comes in. 
And I want you to hear me. No matter where you're listening, no matter what you have done, no matter where you have been, I need you to hear this because it doesn't matter any of those things. It doesn't matter who you've worshiped. You need to understand that there is forgiveness available through Jesus Christ right now for those very things. Even as you're watching on a computer in this very moment, you can turn to God. You can say, God, I am sorry for these things and you can run towards him. Listen to 1 John Chapter one, verse nine, it says, if, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. You see, church, here's what I've learned about idols. I've learned that you cannot replace an idol by simply just turning from it. You actually have to move or run towards something in replace of it. You see, and that's essentially what repentance is in the Bible. If I'm running this direction, then it means I have to turn and go this direction. I have to do a 180 and go away from it. And that thing I must turn to is Jesus. And so how do I do that? How do I turn my soul? How do I direct my soul to Jesus? How do I love God with all of my soul and all my always will be in times like this, especially in times like this, where the world seems to be in absolute chaos because maybe I don't know if I'm gonna have a job the end of this week or I don't know how I'm going to pay my mortgage the end of this month. Or maybe your family's driving you bonkers because you're trying to learn social distancing, you're trying to learn distance learning and do work from home and it's just not working and you're gonna strangle one of your kids. Or maybe there's some fear. There's some fear because your child has respiratory issues and you're wondering, will they be, perf- per- will they be protected from the virus? Will they, will they be okay? In the midst of these things, Would you allow me today to share four practical things that we can do to turn our souls to Jesus in the midst of crazy? These are things that I have just recently learned and I've recently been practicing myself in the chaos of my own life. And we're gonna be releasing this week on social media some tools each and every day that are off of these four things. And so if you need to turn your soul to Jesus, pick one of these and begin to do them. The first is this, pray the Psalms. You see, when we look into the Psalms, we can see people from the past who love God fervently. They love him so deeply, but in the midst of that, we can see real emotions. We can see that they felt anger and fear and grief. And so I begin to start reading the Psalms and I'm praying the Psalms and I'm looking over them and I begin to relate to it. Here's what I mean. Look at Psalm 42. This is written by David who goes down as a man after God's own heart. Listen to what he says. He says, as the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. Man, that's awesome. I begin reading that and I think, wow, that's really spiritual. But the problem is, I'm not that spiritual. Well, hang on. Look at verse three if we were to continue reading. He says, day and night, I have only tears for food. Can you relate to that? Where you feel like you just can't cry enough? Now, I know the guys listening are like, oh, no, 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 that's not me. I I don't do that. Listen, I don't care who you are. If you've lived life long enough, you will be here. You will experience this. And so as I read through, as I pray, as I meditate on these, God does something in my heart as I'm engaging with his scripture. And I even find there's points that I don't know what to say except for God, that, that right there, that's how I feel. Or maybe for you, it's not grief, but it's fear. In Psalm 55, it says, fear and trembling overwhelm me and I cannot stop shaking. Have you ever been there? at that place where you're so fearful of what's going on, at that place you don't know what's gonna happen next, all you know is that there, you are just fearful that it's built up inside of you. You see, loving God with all of your soul means being honest with God. It means taking my fears and my emotions and asking God to redeem them. And for me, I have learned that praying through the Psalms has unlocked this in my life. 
It has unlocked my ability to love God with all of my soul. The second thing is to worship free of inhibition or to participate in worship. Because you see, worshiping free means that I worship God without anything getting in the way. It's worshiping him with all that I am because he is good, he is worthy, he is deserving of that. Now, this doesn't mean by showing up to church, by logging online, that I have actually worshiped. You can show up to church, you can log in online and watch a service and still not have worshiped. Because worshiping free means that I come and I engage with the Lord. It means that I bring my passions and I bring my personality. And I think that's why when the Bible talks about worship, it talks about clapping our hands, raising our hands, singing praise to him, praising his name out loud. You see, you can do this from your home. You can do this as you're watching online. You can do this as you're practicing social distancing. You can worship free of inhibition. Now, some of you may say to me though, well, Pastor Cody, that's fine, but I'm, I'm kind of a quiet person. And I would say that's great, that's okay, but here's the deal. If you're a level three person out there in your work and with your friends and the activities you're involved in, if you're a level three out there, then please don't bring level one worship to Jesus when you come into his house. That is not okay because God wants all of your passions and he wants you to participate in worship because he deserves that worship. You see, I think of it like this. For any of you that know me, you know I love my calendar. I love everything to be organized and fit neatly and I know where it's coming next and where I've been and what's happening. To me, outside of my salvation and my relationship with Jesus and my family, calendars are the next greatest gift God has ever given anyone. And if you uh, aren't using a calendar, you're missing out on so much joy. But I digress a little bit, but think of it like this. My relationship with Kristen, what if my love for my calendar actually drove my relationship with Kristen. So I look at my calendar and I go to Kristen and I say, hey babe, it is Monday at 10 a.m. I'm supposed to tell you I love you. So I love you and I'll be back same time next week to let you know that. My calendar goes off with an alert. Hey Kristen, it's Tuesday. Uh, I'm supposed to give you a kiss, so come here, let me give you a kiss. And then next week I'll be back at the same time to do it. Or it goes off again and I say Wednesday, I say, hey babe, it's two o'clock on Wednesday. I'm supposed to tell you you look beautiful. So you look beautiful. See you next week. How do you think that would go in my relationship with Kristen? Not well. Listen, this doesn't work well with God either. He wants your heart. He, where, he wants to know where your passion is at and where your desires are at. And the result is, is that we just don't show up on Sunday to worship free. It means that we live out a Romans 12 lifestyle which says that when we come to God, we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him and that this is our spiritual act of worship. It means then that I worship him every single day with my life, not just in song, but with how I live. So point your soul to God through worshiping free of inhibition. Number three. Unplug from social media. This is really, really important, especially right now. And some of you need to do this because you're on social media way too much and you're finding that your soul is depressed and it's heavy and the reason that it's not healthy is because of all the negative stuff that you're consuming on social media. No one can watch 12 hours of the news and not come out with a depressed soul. Because here's the deal, if you watch 12 hours of news, you don't understand this, and this is what you need to understand is that the shoulder, your shoulders were not made to carry the weight of the world. Jesus's were. So turn it off for a little bit. Unplug for a while, not forever. Avoid the negative things that seem to be pulling you away from this internal perspective, eternal perspective in this relationship with God and begin to feed your soul on the things of God. Listen to Philippians 4, chapter eight. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And number four, talk and pray with a friend or a counselor. 
There's something about saying to someone, listen, I feel a little anxious right now in life. I feel a little fearful or I'm angry. Will you check in on me? Will you ask me how I'm doing? And, and can, we, can we pray together through this? Can I tell you that this is powerful, but it is incredibly scary because it requires you to be vulnerable. And here's the deal, we all need the church. It's important to be engaged with the church, not just to attend church, but to do life with the church. Because you see, if you do life with the church, you're going to find support in your community group. You're going to find support from a pastor. If you're walking through the discipleship pathway, you'll have support of going through life with this person and talking through things and walking through whatever may come up. And the reality is, is in doing so, in doing this, we are loving God with all of our soul because God does not want us to say, I have no anger, I have no fear, I have no frustration. He wants you to bring all of you, which includes your fear, your anger, your frustration. So church, immerse yourself in the love of God. Immerse yourself in the grace of God and the body of Christ. And when you do, what happens is the loveliness of God begins to consume me. And he takes these things and he redeems them. He takes my anger and he replaces it with joy. He takes my fear and replaces it with faith. You see, all of this happens when I begin to point my soul to God and to love him with all of my will always be. So how's your soul? I wanna close today with a story. It's about a guy named Horatio Spafford and he was this prominent lawyer who lived in Chicago in the mid 19th century. You see, and in spite of his wealth, in spite of things going well, he was a man who faced really heartbreaking situations. In 1871, his only son died at the age of four. Then in that same year, the great Chicago fire came through and left him in financial ruin. Two years later, he was scheduled to go to Europe and uh, he had to stay back in Chicago to work on the zoning problems that were created by the fire. So he placed his family, his four girls and his wife on a ship and sent them across the Atlantic and they ended up getting into a shipwreck, colliding with another ship and began to sink rapidly. Tragically, all four of Mr. Spafford's remaining children drowned at sea. And his only wife, Anna, she survived um, not his only wife, but only his wife, Anna, survived. And when she reached safety, she sent this famous telegram with the news that read, saved alone. Now, I don't know about you, but I cannot even begin to imagine life in these circumstances. And honestly, they probably would have crushed me. But however, they didn't crush Mr. Spafford because shortly after he got the news of the tragedy, he himself got on a ship and he began to go meet his grieving wife. And as his ship sailed over near that area where his children had recently passed, he ended up writing this song with these words of inspiration that were inspired, inspired through the tragedy. And now this song has been sung around the world. It is well with my soul. <laughs>